Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about agriculture. Topic for the day is going to be genetic engineering. So in an effort to make this nice and short, let me get you some objectives and we'll get going. First thing I need you to know or be able to do by the end of this video is to understand the purpose of genetically modified organisms and discuss the benefits and drawbacks of genetically modified organisms. So today, obviously, we're talking about GMOs. Before we talk about GMOs, though, I want to talk about what there was before GMOs. Going way back to that mark about 10,000 years ago with the agricultural revolution, people realized that if I take two animals that have traits that I like and breed them together, their kids are probably going to have those traits. It's called selective breeding. So throughout agricultural history up until, I don't know, probably 20, 30 years ago, that was the way that farmers got the traits that they wanted. They took their corn that had the best production, they mated it together, the offspring had better corn production. They took the animals that were the strongest, mated them together, the offspring were stronger. So throughout agricultural history, farmers have selectively bred for the traits that they want. Now, with the advent of science, we've gotten to a place where we can speed up and tweak the process through genetically modifying an organism. So let's talk about this process of creating a GMO, and then we're going to talk about some of the benefits and drawbacks and all that good stuff. So Essentially, if we're going to make a GMO, we're going to take a desirable trait from one organism and place it into another organism. The example I'm going to use today is the BT gene. It's from a bacteria known as Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, we'll talk more about Bacillus thuringiensis in a moment, but for now, just recognize that the gene we're dealing with provides pesticide, or provides the ability to produce a pesticide. So what you do is you get into the DNA for that bacteria and you identify the gene that you are looking for, the strand of DNA that you are after. You use some restriction enzymes to cut just that gene out of the DNA from the bacteria. You then isolate the gene and you stick the isolated gene into the DNA for your corn. Now we'll talk about the hows and whys of how to do that when you take AP Bio with me down the road. For now just know that you cut the desired gene out of the bacteria and then you stick it into a strand of DNA that is going to go into a plasmid. A plasmid is a little ring of DNA that bacteria carry around. So what you do is we have now gotten our desired gene into the plasmid. This plasmid is then going to be inserted into a bacteria and once it's inside the bacteria, the bacteria will reproduce and reproduce and reproduce and every time that bacteria reproduces the genes that are inside that bacteria get reproduced so you now have many copies of the genes you can then take the copy of the gene that you need work it into the DNA of your corn after you get it worked into the DNA of your corn all of your corn that grows is going to express that BT gene, which means the corn is going to produce its own pesticides. So that's basically what a genetically modified organism is. It's an organism that has had a gene from another different type of organism inserted into it for some purpose. As with any scientific uh, endeavor, there are benefits and there are drawbacks. So we're going to talk about the benefits first and then the drawbacks. The benefits I want you to be aware of are increased crop yield and quality, fewer pesticides use, and increased profits, which farmers like. First up on the base is going to be increased crop yield. And there's a couple ways that genetically modifying crops can increase the yield. The first one is resistance to pests. If your uh, crop is resistant to the pests that would normally attack it, then obviously you're going to be able to produce more food on a given area of land because you don't have pests eating your crop. Also, you can engineer crops so that they are resistant to drought, which means that if there is a drought in your area, you're still going to be able to raise your crops where you normally would not be able to do so. So both of those would be ways that uh, crop yield can be increased. You can also increase the production of essential nutrients. One thing that you want to know about related to this is a product called golden rice. As we talked about in yesterday's video, rice is a large proportion of the diet around the world, especially in the developing world. Problem is, uh, rice is fairly nutrient poor. And in the developing world, vitamin A deficiency is a really big problem. And if you are deficient in vitamin A, you can go blind. So scientists have worked to genetically engineer rice such that it produces the pigments 
that um, carry vitamin A, and those pigments are yellow. So rice that has had this genetic modification is bright yellow, and it's called golden rice. People who eat it get the vitamin A that they need, and scientists have said, hey, if we could plant this in the developing world, then people would be able to eat this rice. They would get the vitamin A they would need. They would not be vitamin A deficient and blindness wouldn't be as big of a problem. At the moment, golden rice is still under experimentation, so it has not been released to the public, but hopefully in the future that's something that we will see go out onto the market, though it is not without its controversies. Pesticide use is another problem that can be addressed through the use of genetically engineering organisms. As I talked about in that first example, there is a soil bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis that produces a natural insecticide, so the stuff just naturally comes out of the bacteria and it kills insects. Uh, researchers have been able to take that gene, stick it into various crops. Those crops then produce their own natural pesticide, which means that the crops don't need to be sprayed with pesticides. Now that has a twofold benefit. One, for farmers, it's cheaper because pesticides are expensive. For the consumer, it's good because we are not eating foods that have been sprayed in pesticides. There's also a product called a Roundup Ready Plant. Now, Big manufacturer, Monsanto, they do tons of things that are very controversial, but they have produced, they produce the herbicide pest, uh, let me try that again, words are hard, they produce the herbicide Roundup, and Roundup is a weed killer. So they have also genetically engineered plants that are resistant to Roundup. So basically what a farmer can do is they can spray their whole crop with Roundup, it will kill off any of the weeds, but the crop plants that have been genetically modified will survive. So be aware of the BT gene and corn and Roundup Ready plants. All of this can lead to increased profits, which farmers love. If you're using fewer pesticides, that means you don't have to pay for pesticide. If your crops are giving off more yield, then you've got more stuff to sell, which means more profit for farmers. Also, if there's more food on the market, it's possible that food prices would be cheaper. Enough said about that. Now, if we are talking about where uh, genetically modified organisms are used, um, feelings about them, sentiment, it's all going to depend on where you are and what your priorities are. If you are in Europe, you are not going to see much by the way of GMOs. Uh, genetically modified organisms are highly regulated in Europe. Um, I don't know that they are even legal to be produced. So that would be Europe. Jump across the Atlantic to America, 63% of our corn is genetically modified, 91% of our soybeans are genetically modified, and 71% of our corn is, or of our cotton is genetically modified. So I guarantee you that unless you eat a 100% organic diet, you will eat genetically modified organisms every single day. Um, to have the organic label on a food product, it cannot have any GMOs in it. So just a little tidbit to be aware of. As is the case with any technology, there are always concerns associated with the use of genetically modified organisms. Major ones that I want you to be aware of are just general safety, effects on biodiversity, and regulation. I'm going to talk through those three, and then that'll be the end of our video. So first major concern is going to be safety. Are people allergic? Is it safe to eat? Who knows? To this point, scientists have not been able to show that there are harmful side effects of eating genetically modified foods. Problem is, a lot of people would argue, well, if somebody is allergic to a particular organism, what happens if a gene from that organism is removed and placed into another crop? Would they be allergic to the crop that has received the gene from the organism that they are allergic to? Shorter answer is, we don't know. So a lot of people debate the use of GMOs, and when that debate happens, a lot of the debate happens around this idea of safety. Are people allergic to it? Is it safe for people to eat? And the fact that we really don't know at this point. Another point of debate is biodiversity. Two major concerns around biodiversity. The first one is the spread of GMOs to wild populations. So a lot of times you can have a genetically modified organism that can cross breed with its wild cousins or relatives. This could be plants uh, interbreeding with wild plants in the surrounding areas. This could be fish interbreeding with fish that are in the area that they are swimming in. And we don't know what the effect of that would be. People are concerned that if genetically modified organisms are able to spread into the wild and mate with wild populations, then it would decrease the abundance and the diversity of the wild population because the genetically modified organism is better able to survive in the environment. So in letting that loose on the environment, 
environment, we might be tipping some ecosystem balance. There's also the idea that in using genetically modified organisms, you're reducing the biodiversity of food crops. And if you reduce the biodiversity of food crops, you could be losing beneficial traits. It's possible that your GMO crop might be susceptible to some disease that your normal population is resistant to, but you would never be able to do any research to find the genes in your normal population to put in your GMOs because you have gotten rid of the normal population through genetically modifying them. So there's ideas, there's multiple problems when it comes to uh, biodiversity or debate around the idea of biodiversity and genetically modified organisms. And the last concern that you need to be aware of is regulation. And again, this goes back to where you are. Like I said, in Europe, GMOs are heavily regulated. In America, there has been a lot of fighting, and at the moment, there is no regulation on genetically modified organisms. Um, foods that have got GMOs in them do not have to be labeled. In Europe, you can't even put GMOs in food. So at the moment in America, like I said, you will probably eat genetically modified food every day unless you eat completely organic, and you will never know that you are doing it because at the moment, there is no regulation around genetically modified organisms. And that's it. Hopefully this video was shorter than most. Um, make sure that you are aware of what a genetically modified organism is, roughly how it's created, benefits and drawbacks. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and hopefully we'll see you again.